Hey everybody. Uh, so before we get started, um, I'm going to ask just a few of you to type in if you can hear me. Just type the word yes. Not everybody needs to do it because if a few of you hear me, all of you hear me. So if one or two of you could type in yes, if you can hear me, that would be great. I don't see that yet. Okay, got it. We're good. Madeline's telling me. Excellent. Excellent. So this is this is going to be fun. I'm really enjoying doing these guys. You guys doing these these Q and A's, guys. Um, you have great questions, and there's nothing better than I like that that I like to do than answer questions about licensing. I'm not an expert at many things in life, but I don't know. You do something for 20 years, you better be good at it. And I, I think I'm pretty good at answering you guys' questions, and I I enjoy it uh, because I know that this is part of who you guys are. Um, just started coming up with ideas one day and it basically became part of who you are. And I know this is very important to you. So that's why I enjoy doing this um, and why I've been doing it for, for uh, 20 plus years. So um, let's get started. Um, before, before I do get started though, I wanna say, I'm gonna, we're gonna have a special guest about 30 minutes in. My daughter, Giovanna, um, she's seven going on eight. And uh, she knows that I'm doing these live sessions. She's a big YouTube fan as well as I am. I watch a lot of people on YouTube. And she pretty much insisted on coming on. And I said, great, you can help me out with two questions. So about 30 minutes in, uh, she's going to come on and help us out with two questions. So that should be fun. So stick around for that. All right. So let's get going, guys. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, Jake has the first question here. Let me pull this over here so I can see a little better. When licensing to DRTV, do I need to have industry inventory and stock of my product, or can it be arranged that DRTV will manufacture and hold inventory while we collect licensing royalties? Thank you for doing these live Q and A's. It's a huge help. So Jake, um, these DRTV companies are, are huge and the volume they're doing is insane. They would never let you handle that volume yourself they're going to want to do that. They're gonna to wanna to get the price down rock bottom low because they're all about profit margins. DRTV are all about making a good, decent profit margin and selling massive amounts. And so for you to make it, you could probably never get the profit margins, the cost of the product down for the, far enough for it to be worth it for them to, um, use your manufacturing. Um, if you're a manufacturing expert and you have half a million, millions of dollars, there's a possibility they'll do some sort of joint thing where you're gonna manufacture it as well, but that's it, they're gonna make it. So, um, Hadi's next question. Hi, Andrew, how do you evaluate a patent? Um, well, as I always like shocking people uh, to say this, and it's just to shock you, it's not because patents aren't important, but at the beginning, you shouldn't evaluate other people's patents at all. Uh, you should evaluate what else is in the marketplace. How does my product fit into those other dog toys that are chew toys that work in this sort of way? And you figure that out first. Um, and so you evaluate the marketplace first. But then once you've done that and you verify, you believe that your product fits into the marketplace, and you use that, do that using Google Images, Amazon, other techniques, Google Images being my favorite, um, then you want to evaluate the patent. And you can, you, we, we talk about this every time, it seems like at the top of the hour, so I'm gonna keep this really short. You have to read through the claims and see what they're actually protecting. So that's how you evaluate a patent. Um, Tommy says, I wanna hire a graphic designer to design my product, but don't want him to steal my idea. How do I make a good NDA? So, um, you know, the average graphic designer, whether they're overseas or here in the US, if you're in the US, they're the last person in the world that's gonna steal your idea. I mean, even if they love the idea, are they gonna raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to venture it and sell it themselves? Are they, or in the case of licensing, which is what we teach, which you don't need all that money because you're getting the company to pay for all that. Um, do they know how to license? Even the average business person doesn't know how to license. I've talked to people that are former CEOs for major Fortune 500 companies. They don't understand how licensing works. They don't understand the things that we teach, how at a grassroots level, for some products, you can literally spend less than 200 bucks and you could be showing it to companies and then you're dumping it on them and it's their money 
workforce and existing distribution. And so um, is a graphic designer going to steal your idea? It's possible. Have I ever seen it in 20 years of doing event right? Never once, not even remotely. But you do want any um, contractor making a prototype or making doing graphic design or virtual prototype or anything for you to sign an NDA and run screaming if they don't. You, they need to sign an NDA. So your question is, how do I get a good NDA? And so this is a good time for a disclaimer. Everything that I'm talking about tonight is not considered legal advice. Please contact an attorney if you need legal advice. Um, you can find NDAs online, but you know they might not be appropriate specifically for what you're doing. Um, there one little deal, one little um, addition that for those of you who are familiar with NDAs that might not be familiar with this, especially when you have a vendor like a graphic designer or a prototype or somebody, it's perfectly acceptable to include an additional clause called an improvement clause. And what this clause says is any improvements they come up with to your idea, you own. A graphic designer, a prototype, or any of those guys should be okay with signing that. But if you ask a potential licensee, a company you're trying to sell your idea to to sign it, that's a little scary for them. So you definitely don't want to do that up front. Again, this is not legal advice. Seek advice from your attorney. But our approach is that is because then anything variation, how what's a variation? Could be a, a lot of different things that they come up with in the future. You're saying you own their butt, and that's not okay. So. Um, but you can get a potential licensee to sign an NDA with an improvements clause. If it's at the right point, you've got a lot of interest, you're sending them a lot of stuff, you can verify that they're not working on similar things. But for a graphic designer or a prototyper, they should be willing to send that, sign that. So I can't tell you, use this NDA. I can't, because even for our students, when we give samples, it says copy, and we're not saying use this NDA. So, um, but what I can say is, that an improvements clause will go that extra mile that they own, you own, sorry, got that backwards, you own any improvement that they come up with. So that was a very detailed answer. Um, let's see what else we got here. Tommy, um, uh, Tommy, that was for Tommy. So thank you, Tommy. Great question. Um, Amir, uh, me not being an American, can I have an American partner with me to reach out to companies that only accept American-based submissions, like in the case of Hasbro? So last Thursday, Hasbro came on, and they, I was kind of surprised where they said that on their submission form on their site that they can only at this time accept ideas from American inventors. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. I haven't heard that before. I'm sure there are some companies that say that that's their policy. But so, Amir... Don't think that that's the norm. And, you know, I'm going to I'm going to say this because I think it's very important for new and experienced inventors. Inventors, when they're new to licensing, they experience one thing. So Amir experienced Hasbro saying we can only receive submissions from American inventors unless we're doing uh, outreach, which they do do in Europe and other places, which they mentioned. Um, so and now Amir is thinking that's the case which is absolutely not the case. We've had students in over 65 countries and and that's that would be the first time I'm hearing from, I've never heard from a student that said this company, I'm sure one or two, because we got a lot of coaches, we have 10 coaches and a negotiation coach. I'm sure it's happened at some point, but Amir is now thinking because it happened, he heard that on the Hasbro webinar that all the companies feel that way, and it's absolutely not a mirror. So not only is it a lesson in that you don't need to be in the U.S. and you're not restricted whatsoever by being anywhere in the world because they just want a good idea; they don't care where you're from. Um, but it's a lesson in that one one thing happened to you, and now you think that's a blanket thing. And it's not. Now, when our students are getting coaching from us, they'll the coach will they'll say something to the coach. The coach will be like, oh, but that's just really weird. Like, I don't see that happen often at all. I can't remember that ever happening. Or they might say, well, that happens all the time. And here's how you're going to handle it. So I, you know, when you're but for the purposes of this QA session, don't experience one thing once and think that's always the case. And I see inventors doing that all the time. Um, let's see what else we got here. 
Bart, I have an idea for a unique version of speed dating other than obtaining a de domain name, which is a good idea. What is it, like 10 bucks for a year to get a domain name? That's a website address, guys, for those of you who don't know what that is. Would it make sense to obtain a domain name or a copyright or trademark for the name? How can I protect someone with, for stealing my idea? So what Bart is making the false assumption is that it's not protectable with the patent as well. So he's saying copyright, tra trademark, and domain name, which are all valid ways to protect that idea, Bart. But um, it could be what's called, there is design paths, which is just the way something looks. And then there's utility paths with the way something functions. And so... But there's other words we use. There's not technically a method of doing business patent. It's just a phrase or a term that um, patent attorneys use to describe a method of doing business. Like this happens, then this happens, then this happens. So with um, a website idea or speed dating. So for speed dating, I used to do that when I was single eons ago, where you you go it's like in a high school gym usually or somewhere, some large place, and they have a lot of chairs and you go from chair to chair and you talk to people. And then if you both mark the same person as being interested, then after the event, the day later, you get introduced to those people, you know, and it's a kind of a, uh, a little bit more personable than online dating because you're actually talking to the person in person. So they can't lie um, about a lot of things. But so Let's say Bart came up with something for speed dating online or usually speed dating is in person. Um, and that's a method of doing business. So you can file a provisional patent on that, Bart. And so if you're going to approach companies to license this, I would um, go ahead and file a provisional because a big part of our approach is don't go out and spend $10,000 on a patent when you can spend $70 on a provisional patent and see if there's interest. And if there is, get them to pay for the patent or if they're being stubborn and they don't, well, now you got a deal on the table. So then you pay for the patent. So um, so great question, Bart. Um, it's called it a, a method of doing business patent. It's just a utility patent. It's not a particular kind of patent, but it's a way of describing it. Like this happens and this happens. It's the, the process of, of doing that. And that might be patentable. I say might because I can't say for sure, but that would be in addition to copyright trademark and buying the domain name. Um, six, uh, okay, Hoppy Froggy is this person's name. I like your handle, Hoppy Froggy. It's very energetic, I like that. Having a lot of energy when your licensing is important. Uh, what is the best, what is the benefit statement for a novelty or gift product? Oh, I like this question. Uh, by the way, thank you so much for doing these. You're, you're welcome, Hoppy. Your name's Hoppy Froggy, so I'll call you Hoppy. Um, <laughs> what is the benefit statement for doing a novelty or gift product? So sometimes you don't have a benefit. You know, um, it's for a novelty or gift product, it's the fun, it's gross, it's um, funny, it brings a smile to your face. It's edgy. And so it's got different novelties and gifts has those different aspects, right? It brings a, it makes your heart warm. So you kind of make a benefit statements and bullet points to that. So let's say it's something that it's a novelty gift thing. It has a puppy and a baby, okay? And it's some sort of novelty gift item. And people just look at it and go, oh. And so that's what you want to bring up in the sell sheet. Now, even if it's a novelty or gift item, the sell sheet is always for the end user. It's not for the company. So you want them to look at the sell sheet and go, oh God, if our customers saw this, they would buy it. So, you know, you don't write, it's going to make people go, ah, or it's going to warm their heart. You know, you, you got to write copy to that effect. I can't help you write the copy because I don't know what the product is, but you're right. It's not the same solid benefit. It's like what emotions are you tapping into? And you want words that back up those emotions along with the picture. And a lot of times with the novelty gifts, you're going to have a lot less words. You just, people look at it and it elicits a certain emotion. Um, so Ron, Ron Runyon, I, lo I love that name. That's a good alliteration there. Um, oh, Andrew, I have a few ideas. Would a coach help me with evaluating which one to pursue? Yeah, our coaches help our students evaluate the ideas. And I think that's great. Some students, they're like, I got other ideas, but I'm just working on this. And some students are like, I got like 10 
which one should I work on? Usually the coach will help them like whittle it down to three or five, and then they'll go over in more detail each of those. And the coach, you know, the way that we do it is the coach is like, good, bad, good, bad, and work on that one. That's junk. That's not good coaching. So a good coach is going to go, oh, well, here are the upsides and downsides of number one, upsides and downsides of number two, upsides and downsides of number three. Number two is going to be the, a really good first project for you to work on because of this and this and this. And you're like, oh, and number three is good too, but it's going to be a little bit more work because you're still going to have to do this additional stuff. And number one has some pretty big problems and you're going to need to, you can go out and do some research, but on the surface, this is what I'm saying, but this is the research you could do to figure out if this product is viable. So I think a very important skill, if you're going to be inventor in the long term and keep licensing is to know how to evaluate those products. And it's not always what you think it is. Um, I'll give you a few criteria. Um, ease of understanding. So when somebody looks at it, some products require a lot of explanation. And I, that doesn't mean it's not a bad product. And maybe you just need to do extra marketing. But if it's your first time doing it and there's a product that requires less explanation, that's a little bit better. Does that mean that you don't work on a product that requires explanation? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if it's really easy to understand, that's a good first product to work on. And these, when I say good first product, a lot of times the same things apply to good second product, good third, fourth. But you definitely, it's nice if you're, it's nice, not necessary, it's nice if your first project's a little bit easier. And so you look at it and the product is pretty easy to understand. Making the benefit statement and the bullet points, they look at the product, doesn't require a lot of additional explanation. Um, and then some products, there's you, it's pretty obvious there's not going to be any major manufacturing issues. So when they ask you, well, how do you make this? You can give examples of other products and they say, well, I just changed this piece. And they're like, oh, okay. As opposed to it being this, crazy thing like this robot that jumps up on your roof and shingles your house for you and they ask you how it's made and you're like i don't know it's a cool idea you guys figure it out that would be a wacky inventor saying something like that right and so ease of manufacturing ease of understanding um and the fact that there's a a, a market the fact that there are some similar things out there but you've got a tweak to it you know, you've got to change to it. Now, that doesn't mean you can't work on something that there isn't something similar to. That's perfectly fine as well. But if you're asking what makes for an easy first project, those are some of the things that make for an easy first project. Um, uh, Sat, Satbeer, Satbeer, cool name. Um, what should you do when a licensee or manufacturer is unable to figure out how to manufacture the CAD drawing you got from Upwork? Is it a matter of finding another great engineer and getting a better CAD? Um, well, first off, the vast majority of our students don't need to provide CAD drawings to potential licensees that show interest in their product, but definitely a percentage of them do. And um, what will happen sometimes is you'll get somebody to do CAD is computer aided drawing. So it's like a engineering drawing with dimensions for those you don't know what CAD is. Um, and you'll get some engineer and he may or may not understand manufacturing or understand manufacturing in that area. Anybody can do a CAD drawing, but does that drawing and the way the engineer did it make sense for mass manufacturing. And a lot of times you'll go to some place like Upwork or Five or some place where you get some engineer to do it. And they're like, this isn't going to work with what you're giving me. So, you know, the question is like, what are the issues? So if you did give that to them, hoping that it would be enough, they can come back and they got some quotes in China or an American manufacturer, whoever. And they're saying, well, here's why this is going to be a problem. And you're like, oh, well, you know, I've got a solution to that. Maybe just verbalize it. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll go back to the manufacturer that we want to make this and we'll explain that to them. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, we could do that. So even the man, so when the, it's confusing the word manufacturer. So the brand, the company that's in Walmart, that's in Home Depot, that's the company you're licensing to. And they may be talking to a contract manufacturer in China that can make this, right? Um, and so that's the manufacturer I'm talking about. They're the brand that you license to. So sometimes it's really like they just don't make much of an effort. Like they send it on over there and the 
China's like, I don't know what this is. I don't know how to do this. We can't do this. And so that happens. You need to communicate with your brand, the company that you're trying to license to. And so that let them tell you what they said couldn't be done and then try to make some tweaks. Um, but that's not uncommon, Set Satbir, um, that the drawings some engineer did for you aren't sufficient for the company. If you can put that off on the company, which a, the vast majority of our students are able to do, you might say, well, okay, guys, do you, you, you have an idea how this can be made? They're like, oh, yeah. Okay, well, do you have what you need to go get some quotes? Do you need something more from me? They might be like, well, we need this and this and this. And you go back to your CAD guy and he does it or you get them to do it. So there's not one way to do this. Um, Jay, Jay Bab, or just go by Jay, I guess. Hey, Andrew, uh, what should you do when a licensee manufacturer is able to figure out? Okay, sorry, that was the same one. Uh, Jay Bab, um, hey, Andrew, thanks for coming out to, to play with us. You're welcome. Jay. My daughter is going to be coming to play with us in nine minutes. She's going to help us answer two questions here. Um, she's smart, smarter than me. Um, if I seek the endorsement of someone at an organization whose backing would tend to boost sales, would that be public disclosure? Um, no, because if you sought an endorsement from a doctor or uh, another company or what have you, when you're approaching potential licensees that can license your product, it's all private. It's all via email and via the phone and you're creating this paper trail on what you're showing them and when. So you just don't put that up on a website. You don't put it up in a public YouTube video. It has to be an unlisted hidden YouTube video. And um, no, that's not considered public disclosure. Um, and so for, for certain products getting into that with endorsements, um, you know, getting a doctor to endorse it, or if it's a physical therapy and you get three physical therapists or patients to endorse it or what have you, that's an example of an endorsement. And those can be great and not too hard to get. Now, when you show it to those people you to get the endorsement, you have them sign a non-disclosure. I know I talked about, don't ask every company to sign a non-disclosure, use your provisional patent. And again, not legal advice, consult your attorney if you want legal advice. Um, but, uh, so that I distracted myself with that stupid disclaimer. Uh, so that's not public disclosure. But if you're if you're sh if you're talking to uh, a doctor and you want their endorsement, you need to get them to sign an NDA. That's the smart thing to do. Uh, Lana, we got a lot of questions on DRTV. So I want to remind everybody tomorrow night we have Trish coming off with coming on from All Star Marketing. They're one of the biggest. Uh, infomercial companies out there. They did the Snuggie. You guys remember the Snuggie? Um, that was huge. If not, look it up. And they're going to come on tomorrow night. And that's free for the public. That's another um, free thing we're doing for, for all our fans. And that is tomorrow night. Um, uh, Madeline can throw the link in the chat right now. And uh, then also she can throw it in, in there again at the end. Um, so uh, Lana's question was, can I license the DRTV? I have a working prototype and a PT PPA, but cannot afford manufacturing, packaging, inventory. What options are available for DRTV? Well, going back to the earlier question, they don't want you to. Um, they want to do it because they can get ridiculously low pricing because of mass manufacturing, which is the only thing DRTV is interested in for the most part. They don't want to sell a few units like somebody that sells a manufacturer that sells at retail. They want to sell bazillions of units, not actually bazillions, but you get the idea. Um, so uh, you're not going to be doing that anyway. So do not worry about that. If you've got a working prototype and a PPA, the most important thing you can do, Lana, for a DRTV is make a short video. It doesn't matter if it's a little cheesy or crude. They can envision what it would be, and you got to look at the format. Go on some of these DRTV sites. Look at the format, problem, solution, problem, solution. Keep it under a minute, minute and a half max. I would say 30 seconds to a minute and a half max. Sweet spot, 30 seconds to a minute, but no longer than 90 seconds. And you can, you can shoot it on your iPhone. But I would highly recommend if you have a DRTV infomercial product to do a video. And you got to kind of storyboard it and work it out. Um, but that's kind of, that's what they want to see. They really like videos. Um, because going back to that, whether it's a DRTV product or standard consumer product, marketing managers are not going to spend a whole bunch of time to try to figure it out. They're going to look at it 
and you've got six to 10 seconds to make an impression. And if it's a video and it's 60 seconds, well, okay, don't lose them in the first 20 seconds. So that's the, all the time you have. They will not go, oh, well, it could be this. Well, it could be that. You know, you, they need to get the benefit. Now, if your video is kind of crude, that's okay. Don't get on there and say, hey, uh, my name is Jay and I'm an inventor and I've been thinking about ideas for none of that. It's a, it's a freaking infomercial like you would see. And yeah, it's cheesy because you're doing it and you're shooting it and your, your spouse is shooting it or a friend is shooting it and it's in your garage or somewhere. Or, you know, if it's a kitchen product, shoot it in your kitchen. If it's a tool, shoot it in your garage. Use some common sense. Um, but don't think it needs to be super refined or go out and spend thousands of dollars getting a professional videographer to do this for you. That's You're, you're limited on money, Lana. You already said that. Um, you spent some money on the prototype and the PPA. You don't need to spend a ton of money on that video. And Trish will come on tomorrow night and say, don't do that. Do it yourself. It's fine. But do a good job. Um, and inventors struggle with that. It's I know it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, let's see, Oliver says, one of the one of the biggest freight manufacturers in the world just offered me exclusive on my product. When I asked how many they can sell, the guy hit me with, well, that's the million dollar question. Who knows? Question is, if he's unwilling to do minimum guarantee, should I just walk or do a short term deal? Um, that's very involved, Oliver. A big part of what we guide our students to do and our negotiation coach Paul does with our students is to help them understand that when you get interest, first thing you want to do is get on the phone, which it sounds like you probably did with, with Oliver, with this potential licensee. And you want to interview them and pull all this information out. Well, so, so how does that product sell? How does this product sell? Not just you're going to sell this product, but what are you going to do with it? So if they're on, um, if they say, oh, we can get into Walmart. I've, I've had this happen to students. And then later a student realizes it's just walmart.com. Anybody can get on walmart.com. So you got to define what exactly they're going to do with it and set up the minimum guarantees around that. And minimum guarantees, for those of you who don't know what those are, is the minimum amount the company needs to pay you regardless of what they sell. So they don't want to keep paying you and have they failed to launch it. And you put that in the contract. There's a lot of other terms in the contract as well. So there are other ways of handling that too, Oliver, but I can't get any more in depth than that without knowing the situ your particular situation. Um, if you want to um, call the main number at InventRight and and then ask John or Heather or Talia to put you on with me and say, I was on a webinar, Andrew said put them on. I can help you assess if, uh, if I can help you assess if it makes sense. I don't want you to sign up with coaching if you think this is great interest and it's not. Um, you know, I understand him saying, well, that's the million dollar question. I mean, I get that. Um, but you, you, you need to at least identify what their intentions are and what they're going to commit to. Where are they going to put it? What distribution channels? I say, well, we'll run this little test over here. And then if it does well, we'll do this. Oh, okay. Well, and then you're okay with that or you're not, or we're going to do this. We're going to push it out this way. So there's a big difference there. And I think that if there's one thing I can help all you guys with when you're in a licensing negotiation 80% of the deals will die if you expect them to move the deal forward. You need to be the one that moves it forward. You need to be the one that redirects the conversation at certain points at time. It's absolutely critical. They Most companies don't have this, for, oh, we're going to do this and this and this, and this is how we're going to license from you. A few rare ones do. Most part, you're guiding them more than they're guiding. You're not being pushy. But you're 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 like kind of half answering some things, redirecting it, and they don't even bring it up again because it's something that you don't really want to go down that path. Because as an inventor that is experienced with licensing, you know the path you want to take them with negotiations. And so with our students, they have a licensing coach helps them with everything, but because the negotiations are even that much more sticky, we have one coach, Paul, that specializes in negotiations. When people get to that point, we put them on with Paul, and Paul tells them what to say back the next email, what to say in the next phone call. And it's all based on what they said before and based on how we guide you to guide them and all that sort of thing. But but I but I can tell you that you need to gather the information on what they're going to do with it. So that's that's great advice right there, Oliver. So if that helps out, fantastic. And if you want to call me, you're welcome to. Um, 
Travis Curran, is it safe to license with a company such as Edison Nation? They will develop the product and split royalties 50-50. Do you still own the product? I, I can't comment on Edison Nation. I think that it's always best to go direct to the company you're licensing to. I think that's when you're a pro. I think um, any company, anybody that you, whatever you expect somebody to do the work for you with licensing, um, it's it just doesn't, I don't have an experienced inventors telling me they license products that way. So I think it's always best to go to direct to your potential licensee. Now, the problem is a lot of you guys think you can't do that and you totally can. So you're not approaching the company, you're approaching an individual, a person, just like you and me. And it's a marketing manager usually within that company. Now you need to identify a large number of companies. The average inventor will identify two or three companies. We guide most of our students in most cases to identify 20 or 30. So now you have 20 or 30 chances for success, not two or three. So that's huge. Um, so you need to, hey, sweetie, come on in. So I told you my daughter was going to come in here, and she's going to help me answer the next two questions. So, hey, there you go. Hi, sweetie. Say hi to everybody. Hi. Hi. So what's your name? Gia. Gia, okay. Giovanna or Gia or both? Mm, both. Both, okay. All right, we'll, call, we'll call her Gia. That's what we normally call her. So um, you need to reach out to a lot of companies. And... Um, you, you should go direct to the potential licensees. That's the invent right approach. I'm not saying that some other approach can't work, but that's our approach, okay? So let's see what the next question is. Okay, Richard, so you see this question over here? See Richard question right there? Yeah. So Richard says, hello, Andrew, is having the copyrights on the gameplay instructions of new board games, ooh, you like board games, what board games do you like? Um, we played Monopoly the other day. Yeah. And you won. Yeah. You won for the first time. You really beat both mom and dad, didn't you? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's your answer, Richard. Yeah, we like board games. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, so he has a great question, doesn't he? He said, yeah. um, <laughs> see, even Gia says you got a great question. Is having copyrights on the gameplay instructions of board games sufficient protection for introducing to a new potential licensee? Absolutely. Um, Getting a patent on a board game usually doesn't make sense. The only time it would make sense if you have moving parts like the game Mousetrap. You've never played Mousetrap, have you? Uh, yeah, we, we got You play Mousetrap, the game Mousetrap? Yes. Yeah, we don't own it. Oh, it's cool. Cool. Okay. So um, then maybe if it has some moving parts. But what's really great about board games is you can copyright the rules, which is technically free. If you just get a common law copyright and you, you put the little C. Have you ever seen the little C on things? You know, probably not. A little, little tiny C with a circle. But that's free. You can register with the Library of Congress as a copyright. So it's cheap. It's great. And that, I talked to a board game inventor in San Jose, California, and not an inventor, he had a whole company making board games. And he's like, just, just do the copyright on the rules, on the rules. And so that's fantastic. And it, it rarely makes sense to file a patent on a board game, but there's always exceptions. So that was cool, huh? Yeah. I'll talk about Monopoly. What's your favorite game, board game? What do you like playing the um, most? Or any game? The, the doggy one. The doggy one? Which one's the, the doggy one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the doggy one. Yeah, that one's fun. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, we, hey, you want to stick around for three questions, not just two? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Um, Doug, uh, PPA, good idea now or should I wait? So this is a great question. A PPA is short for provisional patent application. Can you say PPA? PPA. PPA. Say it real quick. PPA. Five times. PPA. PPA. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So a PPA is a provisional patent application. People get really excited about filing a provisional patent. It's like, wow, 70 bucks and I can say patent pending. You don't even need to say provisional patent pending. You say patent pending for a whole year. But the thing is, if you don't know how to approach companies and don't know how to license products, you file the PPA and then you sit on your hands. I'm sticking my hands under my butt right here. I'm sitting on my hands. Sit on your hands, Gia. No. Sit on your hands. Okay, don't sit on your hands. Um, and, and then the year runs out. And, and I'm going to give you an, an extra bonus answer here too. And so the year runs out. So why would you file the PPA? Well, Andrew, somebody could come up with it in the meantime. I'm like, yes, that is true. It's a possibility. But really... 
if you want to be practical about it and save yourself some money, filing a PPA the week before you're ready to start calling would make a lot of sense. You know, and so filing a PPA doesn't really do much. It gives you the warm and fuzzies. Oh, I'm protected now. I got a provisional patent for a whole year and it makes you feel all good. But what's the point if you're not going to approach companies? Now, I, I'm going to tell you how patent attorneys aren't, I was going to use another word, but my daughter's here, so I won't use it. They aren't so kind to inventors and they're a little manipulative at times. So they'll say, you'll, your PPA will be running out. And you've only got a month left on it because it's for 12 months, right? You got a month left. And they'll say, um, well, if you want to preserve your filing rights, you know, you need to file a full utility before that runs out. Or if you want to preserve your filing date. And that's true. So when you file a full utility, they're going to reach back and reference that provisional patent to protect you from the date you filed the provisional. Okay. So um, you get that? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Yes. <laughs> so, um, and that, so that is technically true, but if you haven't shown it to anybody, which a lot of you haven't, you file a PP, you haven't shown it to anybody. And even if you have shown it to people, but only privately, you didn't make a public disclosure on a website or somewhere and you just privately showed it for a license, you can actually file that provisional patent again and get another year. Now it doesn't extend that year. You're going to lose that original date. But what are the chances that somebody came up with something similar in that period of time? So there's the paranoid world that the average attorney lives in, mostly just so they can get you signed up with it. And I think they firmly believe that because patent attorneys never met one that's licensed anything or knows anything about licensing. So they're offering you that advice. And then there's the real world that we live in where you could file a provisional, not do anything with it let it run out, and then you could file it again. You won't, you get your original date from your original provisional, you get your new date from your new provisional. We got it? Yeah. Okay, boy, that was really boring, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't bad, okay. So she's, she's gonna be an inventor, huh? Um, okay, we'll do one more, and then uh, Gia's gonna go, what are you gonna go do after this? I don't know. You don't know? Don't You're gonna play. I hope. You're gonna play. Is mom gonna make you do homework? Already do. Okay, well then you're gonna play. So I'm gonna answer for her. She's gonna play. Um, you better play. Um, okay, next person. So thank you, Doug. Um, great, great thing. If you're really concerned, go ahead and file a provisional for 70 bucks. File it yourself. Um, if you get an attorney to do it, it costs you thousands of dollars. Um, so, and yeah, so uh, be, conserve your money. You don't need to spend money that you don't need to spend. Let's put it that way. The next question is from King Little John. Do you like that name? King Little John? That's his name. That's his handle. That's not his real name. Someone said stay. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, they're typing questions over there too. Okay, so we're going to go over here though. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a calisthenic CrossFit glove that will be perfect for the fitness world. All I have is a drawing of it. What is my next move? Well, um, King... King Little John. I, I love that because it's a glove, man. There's no there's no reason why you couldn't make a prototype of that. Sewn products are great. Find a seamstress, go down to the store, buy an existing calisthenic glove and have them modify it. And it's not necessary. You could do a virtual prototype, but um, on that one, like, why wouldn't you do it? It's a sewn product. Sewn products are great. If you can't sew, find somebody that can sew pretty good and make some sort of prototype, probably cannibalized off of other or some existing product. So, um, so Gia, you are very, very helpful. What do you want to say to people before you take off and go play? Take care and keep inventing. Take care and keep it. Hey, you stole. That's mine. That's mine. That's my line. Take care. I got that copyrighted. No. Okay, I'm going to court. I'm going to take you to court. Okay, no, I'm not. I'm not. Okay, bye, sweetie. Bye. bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You helped out a lot. Uh, Duran, how much time do we have left? Oh, yeah, 21 minutes left. That's cute. That's cool. Uh, Duran, I, I have sent my innovation to the USPTO, now patent pending. Congratulations, Duran. Please give me some great pointers on calling companies. Um, well, Duran, you're not ready to start calling companies. So if you sent your PPA in, great. Um, you need to make your list of companies you're going to reach out to. You need to make your marketing materials. 
And then if you got those things, then you can start calling companies. So let's let's assume that you got those things. Maybe you do have those things done. Um, it's not just calling these days anymore. So part of the program, our, our bootcamp program now that we've added on to uh, is a, a separate program, which is called Smart Pitch. And we teach people to reach out on LinkedIn. So my answer, uh, Duran, is you need to reach out on LinkedIn and you need to reach out on the phone. And you can't just do one, you gotta do both. Um, but for those of you that are afraid, of reaching out on the phone, LinkedIn can be great. The big difference is on the phone, you can look up the company's phone number, you can pick up the phone and just call, right? And if you know what to say and how to get in, you can just do that. With LinkedIn, you gotta kinda like fix up your profile, you gotta make some connections if you're not on LinkedIn at all, Duran, um, and then you can reach out. So there's a little delay, there's some setup with regards to reaching out on LinkedIn to companies for calling, there's not much set up, but you need the confidence to know how to do it. So if for the most part, you're gonna be trying to reach out to marketing managers, um, if you're having a hard time reaching out to them, salespeople will always pick up the phone. Um, you can also reach out to random people in the company and ask them if they can introduce you to somebody. Like, I know, I know, I don't think you're the right person, but can you introduce me to the right person I can submit my idea to? Maybe somebody in marketing. And so you can do that. But at first I would just try to reach out to them. Um, and the biggest thing that I can say is that don't try to pitch them on the phone. The whole purpose of um, your marketing materials, your sell sheet or your video, is so you don't need to sell. I, I would say the vast majority of our students have no sales background whatsoever. And you're just asking permission to send that YouTube video link unlisted. You never put your, vi your product up publicly on YouTube. You make it unlisted so only people with the link can see it, people that you send to, or your sell sheet your one page advertisement for your product. Um, and that's doing all the selling for you. So you shouldn't be pitching your product on the phone. You never need to fly out, meet with them. Getting back to some of the people that were, were asking questions. I have people here that are in the US and the company's 100 miles from them. I tell them not to drive out because the average is usually a phone call, four or five emails, a phone call, five or six emails. The average negotiation, the average back and forth is three months. And so if you fly out, you'll never, the right people will not be in the room and it'll be a waste of time. I've had a few students fight us on that. And every time they come back, Andrew, I don't know why I was so damn stubborn. It was a waste of time, you know? And so it's a drawn out process. So with that said, you have plenty of time. If you've got somebody who knows how to license to lean on them to go, what's the next step? And if you're in another country, you don't have to feel like you need to fly out and meet with them. So it's 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 very empowering to know that you're not going to be on the spot and you don't need to dance on the corporate boardroom table, you know, that and that you don't need to sell, that your sell sheet or your video is going to do the selling for you. So all these th are things that work and things that we've, Steve and I have been teaching for 20 years and most inventors are still not doing. Our students are doing it, which is why our students are licensing. Um, you look at invention promotion companies, their people aren't licensing things. Our students are licensing stuff because they're actually doing the work. So, okay. Um, let's see what else we got. That was from Duran. Thank you, Duran. Um, okay. Uh, uh, ben says, when signing an MNDA, so what he means an MNDA, an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. An MNDA is a mutual non-disclosure agreement that both the company and you will agree not to disclose things or a licensing contract with a company. Well, that's a little confusing, Ben, because those are completely different things, a licensing contract and a mutual NDA. But is it fine to do so in your own name or do you recommend forming an LLC in signing in the, in the name of the LLC? Um, Companies really don't care. I, I think it's important to use some sort of company name. In most states that I know of, if you um, technically you're supposed to file what's called a fictitious business name statement. So if I did um, if I did businesses crazy crazy inventor designs, okay, and I would need to file a fictitious business statement saying Andrew Krauss doing businesses crazy inventor designs. 
But if you use your full surname, in a lot of places, you don't need to file a fictitious business name statement. So your name is Ben Schaefer. So if you say Ben Schaefer Designs. So I think it's good to have an email signature, which is kind of your business card. Ben Schaefer, uh, product developer. I would use product developer if you, that's my favorite go-to. Ben Schaefer Designs. All this doesn't cost you a cent. Um, and Ben Schaefer Designs at Gmail. Don't need to get your own website or anything like that because you don't want to put your stuff up on a website when you're licensing, which is another piece of advice. So the and I'll get to your I'm getting to your question, Ben, which is do I need to form an LLC? So the most important thing is to create a professional appearance. And the vast majority of our students have not filed LLCs because when you're licensing, you're a big one of the reasons due to an LLC, corporation, whatever, because you want to write off all those costs. And you can still do that when you're a sole proprietorship, which is kind of the default thing, which you automatically are when you start a business. And you can still do that, but it's, you're not going to have these massive costs when you're um, running a business and you're licensing because, you know, is somebody going to slip and fall on your sell sheet? You know, and so you haven't done a single licensing deal yet. It's possible. So you should, you need to take a look at, you need to talk to your, uh, financial advisor and your attorney, if you've got tremendous amount of money and you've got all sorts of liability, I've never heard of inventor when they're trying to do a licensing deal getting sued by a company ever. We've never had it happen in 20 years um, or even be sued after they do a deal. It hasn't happened once to any of our students, but it could happen. So if you have a lot of money, it's a good idea to file an LLC. But most of our students just just use, you know, in their email signature, they use that. And company will notice that you're using that. But when you do a licensing deal, when you do a licensing deal, always then, if you haven't filed an LLC, then always, always file an LLC. Do not do a licensing deal under your own name. It's an additional measure of protection. I've had people that license ideas for like ladders and there are things people get really hurt on. You have so many layers of protection when you're licensing. Your first layer of protection is the fact that with most ideas you license, the users that use the, let's say the ladder invention, they don't even know you exist. So if they're going to sue somebody, they're going to sue the company you license to, the manufacturer. Now, if they dig down deep, they might see that you're the inventor, but they're not, with most deals, like they're not putting the inventor's face on the package. And so they don't even know. And even if they did know you exist, they want to go after the big bucks. They want to go after that company. I'm going to sue them because they have the big dollar. So it's very unlikely that they would sue you. Now, in addition, in the licensing contract, it's going to stipulate that they have, and most most retailers that are in any major retail distribution channel, like a Walmart or a Target or Rite Aid or Home Depot or Office Depot or any place like that, they're going to they're gonna insist that the company has product liability insurance. And what you want to do when you do a contract with a company is insist that you're covered under their product liability insurance. And nine times out of 10, probably 49 times out of 50, it, you can get covered under their product liability insurance. It doesn't cost them a dime more. So one, the companies, the, the, some crazy consumer that wants to sue the company doesn't know you exist. They'll sue the company before they sue you. But if they find out you exist, you're covered under the company's product liability insurance. Um, and then for those of you that are not in the U.S. and this lawsuit's happening in the U.S., is somebody going to come to India and or Egypt or Australia and sue you? That's an additional form of protection. So you're covered like every which way till Tuesday, which is the reason why I think it hasn't happened to one of our students. So um, Ben, you need to talk to your accountant and your, your legal advisors to figure it out. But a huge percent of your students, when the deal comes in, you know, the contract comes in, you tell them, I want this to be under this new LLC. They don't care. So you're doing business under Ben Schaefer Designs before, and it was a sole proprietorship, and now you're doing the contract and it's under Ben Schaefer Designs LLC or whatever other name you come up with. They could care less. They just want your product. They don't care. I don't see deals dying because you don't have an LLC. But for your own liability, if you have a lot of money, it might make sense to do that. Um, Okay, uh, Mo, 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 we'll just call you Mo, M O U. Uh, how can I license an app to a medical device company or should I just start making it? Thank you very much from London. Um, well, first off, developing an app is incredibly expensive. 
and problematic. I, I talked to a gentleman that spoke at my inventors group. His name was Ron, and he had worked for Clorox, the big company, forever, and he retired. And he it took him two and a half years and many trials to get the developers to get his app right and cost him in hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's it can be very costly to produce your own app. Um, you got a couple things going on here. You're trying to license an app to a medical device company. Um, if you have no background in app development, I don't recommend inventors work on apps when you know nothing about software development. If you know something about software development, there's no difference between licensing an app and licensing a dog toy because you can tell and tell, talk intelligently to the software geeks. But um, developing an app when you have no background in it, very difficult. Um, both to license and to venture and sell yourself. So my advice for you, Mo, whichever direction you go, if you don't have somebody that really understands apps on your team, not somebody that's going to take you for 50, 100, 200 K to develop this app because you don't know how to keep them in line. You have to have somebody on your team that understands software development. Otherwise you're going to, it's very likely you're going to get screwed. Everybody and their grandmother has an idea for an app these days, and there's plenty of people out there to take advantage of you. So be very careful. If you had, oh, I got a medical device, or I got a dog toy, or I got a kitchen gadget, and you also have an app, I would work on one of those rather than an app, okay? Because it's going to be very, very hard. I'm not saying you don't do it, but you should. You need to have somebody on your team that is an app and software developer. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it either way for licensing or selling it yourself. Um, but you could do a straight up license, but you got to have somebody on a team on your team that knows how to do that. Um, Fu, uh, or Fu, I, I don't know how to pronounce that. I think it's Vietnamese, but um, hello, Andrew, can you license a snack idea to the food industry? Yes, you can license food products, but, um, and the big guys are kind of a pain in the butt um, to license to a craft or whoever. Um, and they, they have like, they'll have these contests and, you know, oh, like submit your best recipe and then win, win um, two months of frozen meals or whatever. And so you're competing sometimes with housewives and other people that are doing these contests with food companies that are basically giving their ideas away for free. And so, um, you know, and it's hard sometimes to have intellectual property on on food, on a snack idea. So now it gets a little bit more complex. You need to quite often get into the method of manufacturing. So you making a, that snack in your kitchen is one thing, but to have it roll off the line at, you know, a thousand units a minute, which is what usually happens with food products, you know, that's a whole different ballgame. So now you need to get into the method of manufacturing with, for the food idea in order to get some sort of patentability. Um, without getting into the method of manufacturing, I've found that, oddly enough, this isn't true for other categories, with food, the smaller food companies or supplement companies are, you're, they're going to be easier to work with as opposed to the crafts or the really big companies. Um, they're going to be a little easier to work with. And and they won't necessarily require intellectual property, even a patent. But to license to a craft without any intellectual property, that's going to be a tough one. But you could find the intellectual property there with the method of manufacturing. you got to understand how it rolls off the machines. Now it gets a lot more complex, which you could come up with ideas all day long where you don't need to do that. So you can't absolutely license snack ideas. It's definitely harder than a consumer product, but it is doable. Um, let's see, Matthew, how do you go about documenting your invention? Do you need a notebook with non tearaway pages? What are the most important aspects of your product to document first? Um, you know, it, it, we switched from, uh, uh, it switched to a true inventor first to filing system as opposed to before, you could not disclose your invention. Anybody have your inventor's notebook and you could get somebody else in trouble for filing a patent on something that's no longer the case. So an inventor's notebook 
is um, weaker, way weaker than it was in the past. It's a good practice, though, to document your invention. And I think it's a good practice to have an inventor notebook and document all your activities, too. So it's a great thing to do. I encourage people to do it. But legally, it doesn't offer you much protection at all these days. It doesn't offer you nearly as much as it used to. I think it's a good practice, but it's it's really, you know, what I tell our students is, with the provisional, it gives you a year. If you know how to license with the invent right approach, you'll never need the year. You'll never, except for as few really difficult types of projects, for 95, 98% of the projects students work on, you'll never need the year. So file the provisional the week before you're ready to start calling. You got a whole year, fish around, see if there's interest. If there's not, you just spent the 70 bucks. So all getting obsessed, it's kind of old school to get obsessed about your inventor's notebook. Um, I don't think that's something to spend a lot of time on. Um, again, not legal advice. Consult your attorney if you need legal advice, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, but um, I do think it's a good idea to document it. And it could come in handy. Um, but the inventors that, you know, just want to document, document, and you've got 200 inventions, 300 inventions. Great. I think it's great you put all that down because a lot of inventors forget about their inventions. So do it, Matthew. Keep doing it. But tear out, non-tear out. It doesn't really matter much anymore. But historically, you get those those uh, marble composition notebooks. I don't have one around. I thought maybe I had one around. And the, the pages aren't. They're sewn in. Get one of those. So let's go old school. Go ahead and do that. Make it so that they, you can't. Uh, it's a bound notebook. You can buy for 99 cents composition notebook at your local office supply place to answer your question. Use that. Okay. Um, Devin. Learning Autodesk or CAD software, is that useful for rendering a prototype? Yes, it is, but I don't advise most inventors do it unless you have a really solid background in both design and engineering. Um, if you spend a, a year learning CAD software, but you could, first off, most of the time it's not going to be required to sell your idea. Um, now you're saying, could I use it for rendering a prototype? But you can go on some sites and get prototypes done super cheap, virtual prototypes. You can find somebody to do the CAD. So if your expertise after getting some experience with licensing is licensing and doing that work, does it make sense for you to mess around for an entire year to use CAD software and still it's only like one fifth as good as a professional would do? You know, it doesn't make sense for most people. Again, I'm not saying that's true for all people. If you have a design and an engineering background, because some engineers, they can do engineering stuff, but it looks terrible because they're not designers. They didn't learn to make things pretty. And then somebody can make things pretty, but don't get them to do the engineering work because they'll mess all that up. So um, I would say the mass, vast majority of inventors, I would not recommend getting CAD software and try to do it all yourself. But if it makes you happy, and you're good at it, but really be, this is one area where it's okay to be judgmental of yourself, show it to other people and go, is this really as good as I could pay somebody a hundred bucks to do? Does it really save you money? Or does it cost you money? You know, that's the main thing. And in that time you messed around with that, you could have worked on licensing six inventions, <laughs> you know? So that's my answer to it. So again, there's no black or white. It's, it, it, it might make sense for you, but for most people, I find that it doesn't. Um, got a couple minutes left. Sue, do I approach a company that is a subsidiary or the umbrella company? Sure. Why not? Approach them all. Get all the irons in the fire, whoever. But once you get somebody that shows interest, they're your superman or superwoman. Don't keep calling around in the company. They showed interest. Just keep talking with them. But before that, it's okay to reach out to multiple people in the company. Not in the wacky inventor way, but a professional inventor way, asking to send your marketing materials. Okay, not saying they're going to make millions of dollars, or you've got an idea and there's nothing like it. The, the the worst things you guys can say is there's nothing like it. It's going to make millions. Never say any of. And you can imagine what the other things that are similar like that. Don't say any of that ever. It's a red flag. They could have shown interest, and now they're like, oh my god, not another one of these. Don't do that. Okay. Um, Okay. Oh, this one's good. Po Pojita. Um, cool name. Uh, how, if that's your handle or not, I don't know. How how much do inventors earn through licensing? So, you know, people think it's all, this is a good thing to end things on. 
people think it's all about the royalty rate and it's not. It's about three things. So it's about the royalty rate. It's about the price of the product. And it's, it's sorry, royalty rate, price of the product. And how much volume are they selling? So, you know, people get obsessed. Oh, is it a 5% royalty? That's so little. Well, if the product is $29.95, they're going to sell half a million units. You do the math. It's huge money, you know, or maybe you get a 10% royalty on a $9 product, but they can only sell 2,000 units a year. So you do those numbers. You, you, you take the royalty rate, you multiply that times the price of the product, and then how much volume they can do. So, you know, it could be for some little gag novelty gift, it might be really minimal. You know, it's, if you license to some rinky dink company that's going to sell very few units, maybe you're earning 2000 in royalties. You license a product that sells for 29 bucks. And, you know, they're going to sell 200,000 units a year. It's $150,000 a year. And then the product sells for five years. What is that? That's three quarter of a million dollars, you know. But for the most part, you're going to earn that money over time. So it, it ranges from $2,000 to hundreds of thousands of dollars. It depends on the product. Um, but that's something you should look at. If making money, not every inventor making money is the first thing for them. They want to express themselves creatively. And it's a secondary, everybody's thinking about it, don't get me wrong. Um, the, the making money is a secondary thing. And I like those inventors because if you have a true passion and it's not just driven by money, but if you're driven by money and your passion for inventing and what you've created, that's a great combination. So it could range from a couple thousand dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars or even even a million dollars a year, it depends on the product. But the three components, write this down, guys. The royalty rate, the most common for a consumer product is 5%. But it, I've seen, we had one student do a deal for 20%. People, like, oh, I want that. Well, it was much lower volume where somebody else did a, a 3% deal and they're making more money than the person that did a 20% deal. But the most common is 5%. Um, the royalty rate, the price of the product, and the volume being sold. And you figure out the volume being sold by interviewing the company and holding them to certain minimum guarantees in the contract and other things as well. So let me page down here. Um, Madeline, I paged all the way to the bottom. So if there's anything you want me to say, you can type that in there now if there's something you want me to say. I would like, Madeline, if you can, I'll give you too many things to do, but if you can, um, at the bottom of the chat, put in the link to uh, the the webinar we have tomorrow with Trish from All Star. So Trish is from All Star. She's a higher up executive at All Star. And All Star did the best selling DRTV product, the Snuggie, and they've done a bunch of other products. Our students have licensed, several of our students have licensed products to All Star. So, and they're gonna come on tomorrow night. So if Madeline could, she's gonna work on putting the link in there. I think even after I end it um, in the recording, but uh, there you go, there's the link. So guys, you have a second now. If you want to register for that, go click on that link right now. I'll give you a few seconds. I'll ramble for a minute or two. Um, oh, so Madeline says she'll leave the link in the video too. But I think when we get done with this, it takes a while for the video encode and then it will go up as a recording. So if for whatever reason you didn't have time to click on that link, um, when you come back, I, I would guess an hour at most, probably 30 minutes, then it will be on our main InventRight TV YouTube page and you'll see it in the description below the video. So if you're watching the recording of this in the future, you can go into um, the, the description. So go ahead and click on that right away and register for that. Um, yeah, Madeline's making a good point. Um, it's tomorrow, so register. Register now, click on the link now, don't wait. Um, I wanna say thank you to my daughter, Giovanna. I thought she was incredibly helpful. She knows I've been doing this. She's a big YouTuber like me. I watch YouTube every night, guys. I love YouTube. Um, I'm honored that that I have a show and that you guys actually love hearing what we have to say. And um, great, thank you. Thank you for all the thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Krause. You guys can call me Andrew. And you left an S off my name, Timothy, but everybody does that, it's okay. Um, Okay, great. I'm going to call it a night, everybody. I want to end on time because I know some of you need to get dinner. Um, thank you so much, Madeline, for helping out with the with the chat. 
and thanks for promoting this. And hope to see you guys uh, tomorrow night on the webinar with Trish from All Star. And we'll catch up with you. And we'll, um, we're going to be doing, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it next Wednesday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 Mountain, 7 Central. I feel like I'm a TV station, 8 Eastern. I'm going to do it again next week. So come on back um, and just go to the Invent Right TV show. Oh, like and subscribe, please. Please subscribe to the channel. Um, that would be great because if you do, then you get notified of all these too. So subscribe if you haven't. And uh, I'm going to stop rambling. I'm going to get going and see you guys. Take care. Keep inventing. My daughter stole that from me. I think I'm going to take her to court. I'm not sure. But take care. Keep inventing, everybody. Bye.